on behalf of the Supreme Council of Planning and Development, the Kuwait Public Policy Center. Today we're gathered for our ninth lecture series from the KPPC Center. <coughs> and today's issue is going to be about nudging, a very interesting issue and new, with one of the pioneers of this field. It's going to be about the rise of nudge and its application on public policy in the region. So nudge. Nudge is a transform transformative innovation that has been rising exponentially around the world with its various applications into the public and private sectors. Even more with the award of Richard Thaler, co-author of the Nudge book and the Nobel Prize in Economics, for his contributions for behavioral economics in 2017. The lecture will shed light on the examples and lessons learned from the application of behavioral science of a variety of public policy settings. Today we have Dr. Fadi Maki. A quick introduction about who is Dr. Fadi. Dr. Fadi is a member of the Council for Behavioral Sciences at the World Economic Forum and a pioneer in the application of behavioral economics to public policy in the Middle East. He founded the first nudge unit in the Middle East, Qatar's Behavioral Insight Unit, within the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, and is the founder of Nudge Lebanon and the Consumer Citizen Lab. He's a senior fellow at Georgetown Qatar and senior public policy fellow at the American University of Beirut, a San Faris Institute of Public Policy. He is also a job professor at HBKU and a visiting lecturer at AUB, where he teaches behavioral economics and policy. He was an economic advisor to the Prime Minister of Lebanon, as well as the Director General of Lebanese Ministry of Economy and Trade from 2002 to 2005. He also worked for Booz and Company, Cisco, as well as Qatar National Food Security Program. He was also the advice to the Qatar Ministry of Finance, Economy and Commerce, where he advised Qatar on trade policy and the World Trade Organization. He was a fellow at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and Cambridge University. He serves on the board of several financial and academic institutions, as well as nonprofit organizations. In Lebanon and the region, he holds a PhD from Cambridge University in international trade and has a degree from LSC, Hull, and AUB. Let us warmly welcome Dr. Fadi Mekki this morning. Thank you very much. Your Excellency Dr. Khalid, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <coughs> I'm honored to be here today in this uh, prestigious lecture series of KPPC. I have been an economist and a practitioner in public policy for 25 years and I have stumbled upon behavioral science and never recovered, proudly so. Today, I will share with you um, a bit of the experience I had, but I'll also talk about behavioral economics and knowledge. And we'll talk about um, the power of insights from behavioral science, from psychology, sociology, economics, and their impact on public policy. I will talk about how this is transforming, has transformed as well, but continue to transform the way government services are conceived, designed, delivered, and assessed. I will also share how policymakers recently and also businesses have discovered the power of behavioral science and its application to various public so the structure of my presentation will be to provide you a brief overview of nudge and behavioral economics, to discuss applications of behavior uh, kind of policies in the Middle East, to the challenges that we're facing in the Middle East, and we'll conclude with lessons learned and the next big thing for, for us in the region. So let me start with a few questions. How many of you have had New Year resolution only three months ago? You said, this year, it's going to be different. I'm going to practice. I'm going to go to the gym three times a week at least. I'm going to start eating healthy. If I'm a smoker, I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to do so many things. How many times we said we're going to do things, but we never actually completed? In behavioral science, we call this the intention action gap. So we say we want to do things. We have great intentions. So we want to exercise, we want to recycle, we want to save for our retirement. 
we want to clean our closet, we want to quit smoking, but we only manage to complete a fraction of that. So that intention action gap is related to something in our brain, biases in our brain. So we have loads of biases that affect our decision making and affects our abilities to do the things that are in our best interest. So for instance, we, what we have what we call present bias. We overvalue immediate rewards at the expense of more lucrative future rewards. We discount the few, we have what we call hyperbolic discounting of the future. We discount the future in a funny way. So we make decisions today that our future self will say we should not have made. We have kind of the tendency to like the status quo, so status quo bias. We overestimate our ability to do things. We're overconfident. We always look for confirmation of, of what we know or what, what favors us. We rely heavily on first value offered in an anchoring to make judgment. So we have all of these things, these biases that affect our judgment. Danny Kahneman, who is a psychologist and won the Nobel Prize in 2002, for prospect theory and his dual system theory, talks about a system one. A system one that we have, that is automatic, intuitive, fast, we use for habitual decision, for easy decision, things that are repetitive, for basic, solving basic problems. The problem with system one is that it's prone to error, it makes mistakes, it uses shortcuts, mental shortcuts, and it's prone to biases. So we have, we use it all the time. However, we have a system two that is contrary to system one. It is deliberate, conscious. We use it for more complex decisions. However, it's a lazy control and gets depleted very easy. So we don't use it very often unless we really have to. So what we have is system one and system two. And what we have actually is that for decades, we have been assuming that people are rational, that they have intimate amount of rationality to process decisions, to make the right decisions, and we actually make those assumptions to formulate policies. So we assume that the moment we make uh, policies and uh, kind of come up with those, people are going to make up the best out of them. They're going to enforce, they're going to the, kind of comply and do the right things. So they, we assume people are rational. However, people started questioning that rationality. And a lot of economists are saying, we have bounded rationality. That's not true. We are econs. And then we are all the time rational. Actually, in fact, behavioral economics, which is that corrective trend in economics, which is now mainstream, seeks to apply psychological insight to human behavior to explain, to better explain decision making. So, what behavioral economics does, it rejects the overly simplistic assumptions about human beings and provides a more realistic assumption about what we do and how we do things. So in particular, behavioral economics takes into consideration that people have bounded rationality, that have biases, and that have mental shortcuts, and that <coughs> are prone to error. And they need to be corrected through that kind of nudge. Now, the golden standard of behavioral economics is experimentation. So we don't know what works. What works is not what you and I think works, but what was tested in, ideally, in a regular setting called randomized controlled trials. So randomized controlled trials so have many uh, kind of ways to assess policies uh, are probably the most well most often used in clinical trials, in medicine, in pharmaceuticals. And basically, it's, it's a way to assess impact by randomly assigning a control group to a treatment to, and another one to uh, another intervention to see the impact. When it's randomized, then problems, uh, the, the impact is probably assessed more accurately. So we've been doing this for decades in clinical trials, in medicine. Before we bring in a new drug, we test it, sometimes for years. But for policies, we have not been doing this. Instead, 
we rely on intuition, we rely on what we think works. So if we want to make behavioral changes, policymakers typically have been relying on two classical tools. The first one is uh, command and control. So a perheel, something like this. So basically, the, 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 this tool says, if you don't do this, I'm going to punch you. I'm going to enforce. The other policy tool, which is the extreme, it's using more financial incentive. So a subsidy. So we've been using those two tools to affect behavioral change. And we know that the first one does not work. So threatening with penalties does not work. I know we have so many of our problems in this region that cannot be implemented through simple enforcement. And at the same time, pouring money at the problem is not a solution. And even if it were a limited solution, it's not sustainable over the long term. So what we have is lunging and the use of behavioral insight as that third tool, which I hasten to add, is not a perfect alternative, but it's a complementary tool of policy to support command and control and behaviorally informed the insect. So nudging to define it as beautifully defined, of course, and coined by Richard Taylor and Gas Sunstein, the uh, author and founder of the concept of nudge theory, is any aspect of choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their uh, economic incentives. So four aspects of nudge. So what's a nudge? It has four characteristics. The first one, it's a small choice architecture type of intervention. Could be default tools, defaulting people into something. It could be using the messenger who communicates the information. It could be priming, using cues that affect our decision making. It could be timely reminders, it could be feedback, it could be salient and attractive messages. Second one, they have these small choice architecture types, have that power to steer gently people in the right direction in a predictable way. Third thing, these are cost effective tools. So a subsidy by definition is not enough because it alters significantly the financial structure. And fourthly, what we need to know, it does, it, it's, uh, it does leave options. So it's choice preserving. It doesn't force people to do it. So <coughs> it's not like nudging has just been discovered. We've been nudged all the time. We, have, we are nudged all the time. We've, media and marketing have been using this all the time to affect consumer behavior, to get people to buy more, to sell more, with the way they frame these decisions. So it's not new. What's new is kind of this great use of behavioral insight and nudge in public policy. People have discovered their power recently for three reasons. The first one, government who started using this came with the premise that they have limitation. They cannot come up with more enforcement or simply that enforcement is not working. Or they're driven by austerity measures because they want to save more. The second one is that behavioral economists who've been talking about this for hundreds of years, starting with Adam Smith, have not given up. They kept writing until it was recognized and became mainstream. Mainstream in particular with Richard Taylor recently winning the Nobel Prize. It has been a great year for behavioral economics. So he won the Nobel Prize six months ago for his great contribution to behavioral economics and for coining that concept of nudge with Cassens. And the third reason why we have this phenomenal rise in the application of nudge in behavioral insights is what we call the rise of nudge. So governments, started realizing this power. And the first one to have realized the importance of this uh, and put it in an institutional setting was David Cameron. David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the UK in 2010, set up the f what became the first nudge unit in the world. It was a group of 
four or five people, behavioral economists, social psychologists, data analysts, public policy experts, and now it grew to become 120 people. Many governments follow suit. President Obama set up his own nudge unit at the White House, the Social and Behavioral Sciences Team, and many governments did the same. We have right now close to 50 nudge units in governments around the world. But of course, the number is much larger if you look at uh, nudge units in the four types. The four main types are either in government or in academia or in NGOs, or in what we call social purpose company. And I just want to say that we stopped counting at about 200 recently, but universities are setting up almost every day their own initiative, either a center or a task force or an interdisciplinary department that brings psychology, behavioral economics, public policy together. So that's happening very fast. In the Arab world, Qatar and Kuwait were the first two countries to recognize this. So Qatar set up the first nudge unit in the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, which oversees the World Cup. Um, and Kuwait recently launched the Kuwait Policy Appraisal Lab, KPAP. Nudge Lebanon, which, which I have proudly uh, founded with a group of like-minded people, is um, a non-governmental entity also <coughs> seeking to apply policy experimentation. And we know that many governments are in the region either setting up their own, Saudi is setting up their own, or thinking about behavioral experiments in the future. So that is happening, and as I like to call it, is taking the region by storm. So if we look at the vision documents and the strategy documents of Arab countries, most of them have a five-year strategy, a 10-year vision, 20-year, and so on. So we have various documents. <coughs> Kuwait has one, the 2035 vision, which has, of course, se seven pillars. Um, education, healthcare, administration, living environment, economy, international position, infrastructure. <coughs> so these have behavioral roots. Each one of them had different strength of the behavior to be addressed through uh, a nudge. But if we look at all these uh, uh, policy documents in the region, they, we find that they deal with similar policy challenges. And these policy challenges that, these, that the region has, basically what we call it has behavioral roots. So uh, that it cannot deal with, only with Tarheed, with command and control, or with pouring money at the problem. So you need to apply using insights from behavioral science to improve. So these, these kind of behavioral roots, one need to be aware of. And I listed uh, eight of those, kind of co our common ground for most Arab countries. So around sustainability and the environment, everybody has that, health, education, Public finance management is becoming very important nowadays. Social welfare and safety net. Economic growth and entrepreneurship. Public administration and public service delivery. And nowadays, uh, recently, uh, humanitarian international development. If we take sustainability and, um, and the environment, we see that, I mean, the, the, the policy challenges are Similar. So we want to preserve the environment, we want to recycle more, we want to decrease use of energy and water, we want to reduce food waste, we want to reduce use of plastic because of, uh, it's, a, it's a poisonous uh, ingredient, doesn't uh, uh, disintegrate well, and so on. So we all have those intentions, but we don't deliver well on that. So either because we don't know how to do it, could be cannot assume that people always know how to do it. Or we don't pay attention to things like this. Or we undervalue the impact of our behavior. Or sometimes we think a single behavior is not very much. We say in Lebanese, So we have these kind of biases, we think about them. And what we see in government that we use, we apply the classical tools 
to environmental uh, sustainability. So we either try to kind of strengthen controls and penalties for those who misuse it, or increase the price, good luck. Or sometimes we use financial incentives to kind of create behavior change, again, not sustainable. Instead, we have a whole gamut, a whole list of behavioral tools and interventions that could be used in the area of sustainability, but also others that have been tested and could be tested. And I'm going to go through some of those to give you an example. So we came up in Nudge Devon and QBIU uh, with uh, what we call shape difference, which is a framework <coughs> for listing some of the key types of nudges that could be applied to various policy situations depending on, on context, of course. So we know hazard is a, and friction is a major kind of showstopper for people to make behavior change. So if you make it easy, you simplify a process, chances are people are going to increase adherence. We know that if you use default, because people are lazy and procrastinating, <coughs> you default them into the scheme, chances are they're not going to opt out. Because not necessarily they are convinced, but probably they don't necessarily act on that intention to opt out. The same thing, uh, ego, feedback, and I'm going to give some of those examples. So let me talk about social norms is one of the most powerful tools in behavioral science that have been used in so many different contexts. So social norms is basically that kind of pressure on people because of knowledge of the trend. So knowing that 80% or 90% are doing this is likely to have an impact on us. So let, let's see one example that was in the US and now has been repeated. So the classical tool, if you want to uh, change people's behavior in an environment, and get them to save water, electricity. You can try increasing the electricity price. You can try penalties. But you can also use social norm. So it turns out that telling someone with their bill, when they receive the utility bill, not only how much they spend, but how much the neighbors spend has an impact on their spending pattern. So knowing something like this has become very useful for policymakers and have been applying it as an additional complementary tool to get people to save more water, to save more electricity, to follow the trend, and to know that they are part of the minority. <coughs> also, sometimes, again, we, because we cannot always assume people are rational, sometimes adding a simple tip sheet, telling them exactly how they can do something, provided it's salient and attractive, it also has a and in fact, that was done in also Costa Rica to <coughs> help uh, reduce water consumption by simply giving uh, 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 households a planning making, plan making tip sheet. Also, other tools that could be used in behavior from behavioral science is basically the power of default. This is one experiment uh, we've done in in, uh, in in Qatar, and we're doing now in Lebanon, and I encourage you to try to experiment yourself with something like this. So to encourage people to take their food, their leftover food, people feel that it's not cool, I don't want to ask, it's not nice to ask for food takeaway. So we made it very easy. So we created a coin that has two sides. Green, yes, I want the food. Red, no, I don't want the food. So that there's no interaction that would be with the, with the waiter. So we randomly selected some tables to green and some to red. And what happened is that 41% of those who were randomly selected to green went with that default. So it means default does work and does encourage, and it's a tiny little step. It actually could be automated and part of the delivery, talabat, and so on, where something like this could be also uh, done for plastic cutlery. And actually, we've done it here also for cutlery. And, and we had a great uh, reference by Richard Taylor saying, this is a great example of, of a low-hanging fruit. What we've done is try to reduce uh, dispensing of plastic cutlery with delivery orders. So when you all get delivery orders, what do you get with it? Plastic cutlery, what do you do with it? <coughs> Throw it away or put it aside. So. The objective of the intervention was to reduce 
sending the plastic cutlery that people end up using, uh, end up not using. So what we did is <coughs> train the call center to ask at the right time, sir, do you want with your food the plastic cutlery? That question reduced basically demand for plastic cutlery by 80%. So something like this now could be automated through the Talabat and so many different kind of platforms so that you kind of make it very easy for people to adopt. And so many other areas that are important for us, water, energy, littering on the street, not gonna go over all of this. But this is, I mean, these tools can be used in, uh, in, in, the, in the, from behavioral science in littering and sustainability health is another area where also can benefit from behavior insight. Again, social norm, I'm bringing that example because it has been used in a particular setting in the UK where some doctors have been overprescribing <coughs> antibiotics. So the intervention was to tell them, based on actually fact finding, that um, telling them that the great majority, 80% of doctors in their local area, uh, prescribed fewer antibiotics. That had in itself an impact on a reduction by 3% of those who were overly prescribed. So use of social norm to give you one example. Another very nice example is sometimes the healthy behavior, if you make it easy and automatic, people will comply. So this is one beautiful example, very well quoted. It's an experiment that was done in Qatar. So, Diabetes is a big problem all over the region. In Qatar, in Kuwait, in Saudi, in Emirates, everybody has. But to test if you are diabetic means that in some of the interventions you need to kind of be on anti-stomach for a couple of hours. Even if you do it for free, good luck. People don't always go to the lab to get uh, that screening. So what we've <coughs> done in Qatar two years ago is waited for Ramadan, for Friday prayer, at the Grand Mosque, and set 20 screening stations. As people were leaving, they tested them. To, to about 2,100 uh, uh, prayers were tested. And what's interesting is that almost one third of those did not know that uh, they are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. So just to illustrate the power of a small intervention, and we know that Diabetes, like many non-communicable diseases, are easier to treat if we detect it early and less costly if we detect it early for health providers. Also, in health as well, exposing people to certain stimuli, priming them, can increase the likelihood of stealing them in the healthy choice. In one experiment that was done in the US, uh, they, they gave slice of apple to shoppers in a supermarket. So those who were given randomly the slice of apple increased their shopping of fruits and vegetables by 28% because they were primed to think about it at the right time. Another experiment we did in Qatar with a researcher from Harvard Kennedy School at the Mira supermarket, we shifted some of the fruits and vegetables near the cashier. And that movement created an increase in the consumption of those fruits and vegetables as people are queuing again at the right time. For a rational people, for a national public, people would say, I know where the fruits and vegetables, I don't need that. But it turns out it does make a difference because we are not all the time rational. And there are various and numerous uh, choice architecture types of interventions in cafeterias to put food, uh, uh, healthy food at eyesight level to put junk food a little bit further away, to create that friction, or to kind of make it more, make the fresh food more appealing and so on. It has been tested in so many different settings, and I encourage you to do that part of kind of testing what, what works. So these, many of these health problems that we all have, have, by, uh, have what we call behavioral roots diabetes, and medication adheres. A lot of people don't adhere. You need that sometimes not to do it. Mental health problems, the earlier you screen it, the, the, the better it is, the less costly. Smoking, traffic accident. And sometimes, I mean, we're not saying, and I repeat, it's not a panacea for all policy challenges, but what, we, what we're trying to say is that 
it might not solve drastically the problem, but would might probably get measurable improvements that you could build on next time and become literally an eternal lab with evidence-based policies as you go. Education, another area which has benefited a lot from behavioral science. This is one example where if you have a bonus, you can behaviorally inform it and have an impact. It was tested by uh, US researchers whereby um, some groups were given uh, teachers basically were given uh, the bonus the typical way. That is, at the end of the year, there are performance measures. If you meet them, you get one, two, three, or whatever bonus. The other group was designed flip side. So they were given the bonus at the beginning of the year, and they were told that it will be taken away if their students do not meet the same measures and targets that the other group got. What's interesting is those that got the bonus up front, their students performed better on standardized tests because of that endowment effect, because of the feeling of loss aversion that we talked about. So that's very interesting as well. We know now text mess texting parents is a very powerful tool of uh, behavioral intervention to either get parents more engaged or to help even improve outcomes, reduce absenteeism, increase engagement, or improve education outcomes generally. So it has been tested in so many different contexts as well. <coughs> Who communicates the message is a nudge. So in one experiment where the uh, social and behavioral science team with researchers in the US uh, ran an experiment, an RCT, whereby one group, um, um, basically the objective was to get disadvantaged students to apply to financial aid. So one group received the normal letter. Another group received the same letter, but from the for former first lady, telling about her own experience. That increased completion rate by 3%, simply because they got it from the right messenger. And that is also something we know and that we use in so many different examples. So in public policy, public finance management, this is a very important area that's going to get more, uh, more priority from governments, given the credit run, crunch, <coughs> given the budget deficit. So that's going to be very important. One of the most quoted examples probably you heard about is in the UK, uh, getting taxpayers to pay on time. Of course, everybody eventually pays, but getting a dollar now is much more valuable than getting it in a couple of months. If you're a public finance, if you're a treasury, if you're a, a minister of finance, bringing forward arrears in a certain fiscal year means a lot. So in that experiment, uh, in a, se it was a series of experiments between 2011 and 2012, it was repeated afterwards, what they've done in this RCT is sent a normal letter to people, which is the control, telling them that you are late and this is what happens if you don't pay. And a, a series of different treatment letters using different nudges, they told, they gave them the same letter with one sentence difference which was the nudge, which is nine out of 10 of people in your neighborhood have paid and you're part of the minority. So that increased payment and sped up, did speed up the the uh, payment rate by, uh, by, by, by percentage points that are significant and then brought forward kind of arrears in the fiscal year. We've tested something similar in Lebanon to get people to pay their utilities uh, bills on time, their electricity bills. So what we tested is the control group gets the normal slip from the collector, sir, this is how much you owe for the month of whatever, January, February, and I'll be back in two days to collect. So this is the control group, and we tested three different nudges. One, using the hassle factor, where we made it clear that basically, if you don't pay now in two days, then chances are you have to go to the headquarters between 7.30 and 1, making it a little bit more, it looked like more inconvenient. The other group, we looked at uh, kind of the baseline, and we saw that within 40 days, people, or around 90% in that area, in Saidam, do pay on time. 
but 90, by 40 days, and after several visits from the collectors. So sometimes they go three, four, five, six times to get that in 40 days, but eventually 90% rate. So the objective of the intervention was to maximize payment at the second visit. So we told them that 90% do pay on time, do you want to be part of this group? And the last one, we used the flag to kind of bring national pride, asking them to play their citizenship role. And what's very interesting, all three interventions, tiny little changes, outperformed the control. One by 5%, not statistically significant, the first one, but the, the last two, social norm and national pride, were statistically significant by 13 and 15%. So that is also becoming more and more powerful. For social welfare, this is also very important for for governments in the region. We all have sometimes complaints, procedures that we create for workers to complain, to, to, to create welfare for them. But sometimes people don't use them, either because they're not aware of them, or they don't trust them, or they don't know how to do it, or what to complain on. So this is one experiment we did in, in, in Qatar with the Worker Welfare Forum, where what we did is gave um, uh, workers represented who meet on a monthly basis and they represent their constituents. They meet on a monthly basis and discuss complaints from their constituents. So we gave some of them, randomly selected, a token, which is a simple notebook that basically has a way for them to take down who, uh, who complained, what type of complaint, something to help them memorize. So those who got the token uh, in, in the forum the next month reported 31% more complaints than those who did. So a tiny, easy reminder to get them to apply. We did a similar <coughs> one where we gave some accommodation, the randomly selected, the treatment, which is simply telling them what type of complaints they can bring in their own languages. So accommodations that got this reported next month, 42% more complaints than those who did not. And, so, and that become that has become the way things are run. We know also that in, in the area of social welfare, donations for charitable causes are important. And it turns out, if you personalize the message, it can help a great deal. So instead of asking someone to donate to cancer or to kind of charity or whatever great cause, you can tell them <coughs> perhaps who's benefiting from this and telling them how much say $100 or $200 will do to that specific person. So that personalization does have an impact. And we've had a couple of experiments to test that for ourselves. Donations can be financial, but they can also be in bodily organs. Nowadays, this is very common. Do you know the difference between um, the blue and the gray? So basically, we have countries that have uh, 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 organ donation in the 90s. Austria, Belgium, France, and we have some that are in single digits. You know the difference between those? is a simple nudge, default. So some, in some countries where it's 90s, citizens are defaulted into the scheme, but they can opt out, but people don't opt out. And the same thing, the other ones in gray, Basically, you're encouraging citizens to opt into this uh, donation scheme, and people either procrastinate or kind of don't do it for whatever reason. So that's, again, to give you the power of the fall. Um, for saving tomorrow, saving scheme, this is also very, very important. Actually, this is one experiment that was done by Richard Thaler, where what they've done because people are loss averse, they don't like to kind of save more or they don't think about saving more because it's too far in the distant future. So that scheme defaulted some groups into saving more the moment there is a salary raise. So those who had that basically ended up in four years uh, with 131% with increase compared to the control. So doing it at the right time, making it the default, that has a very powerful, and we are in a region where we don't save more. So tiny little things like this can have a great impact for pension, for savings later on. Um, <coughs> economic growth. So a lot of the attention that has been 
focused in economic growth and entrepreneurship was on basically getting the unemployed to attend fairs, to uh, kind of apply for uh, jobs, to kind of go to recruitment events, and a lot of sometimes tiny little commitment devices such as basically asking whoever attends the uh, unemployment fair to commit to the job advisors as to what they're doing next week. Those who do that have a greater tendency to actually follow up and then uh, uh, follow up on their intention and even stay off unemployment benefits. So that is also being very commonly used. Um, I, want, I want to focus on one experiment we did in Qatar with an LSE professor uh, um, in, in, uh, in this area of entrepreneurs where what we've done is gave uh, non-finalists in a business uh, uh, a business competition called Challenge 22. We gave them, um, uh, we divide them randomly in two groups and we gave them the behavioral science uh, uh, workshop. That is what's behavioral science, what's our nudge, the cognitive biases. And we gave them real life cases to experiment with. And we gave the same material with one difference. So the treatment uh, group got what we call retrieval practice. And retrieval practice is, is, is a very common uh, tool used in education in classes through sometimes clickers where after 10 or 15 minutes of every section in the workshop, we would stop and ask a question on what they learned in the last 10, 15 minutes. So we would have on the screen the question, they would have a booklet where they would write the answer for a few seconds and then we'd show them the correct answer and then they correct it if it's wrong. So it takes 20, 30 seconds for every question, but repeating it for three hours means for several questions that were raised, and then giving an assessment at the end of both sessions. Basically, eight, they scored 87% higher than the control group, those who got this retrieval practice. So you can behaviorally inform a workshop to maximize its impact in a very powerful way. Um, I'll talk about Public administration nowadays, governments are innovating in how to reinvent government service, how to make it easier, simpler. This is one very nice example that was also done by the social behavior science team in the US where simply shifting the signature box from the typical end of an application form to the top of the application has an impact on the honesty of what we, what we say because we sign I hereby declare that what I will say is correct. It turns out saying it up front before you start filling information has an impact as, uh, on, on what you will end up saying. So that's very interesting that was done. We're using now behavior science to try to fight corruption. In that specific case, we're trying to increase traffic on the hotline in Lebanon by simply making it very salient. So in, what, in that case, we've been running this um, kind of text message from the Lebanese Transparency Association to all people, I mean, 20,000 or so people, they will get SMS message, if you are subject to corruption, so please comply, please send us a note. The, the results were kind of meager, not, not, not many people uh, sent, not because they, they're not probably subject to corruption charges, but probably because it's not coming at the right time. So what we did is, put those posters as they leave some of the government offices at the right time, in the parking space where they're living, next to the trees, next to place, so that it's very salient. And it's actually it increased by multifold immediately within the first week, the number of calls from that specific entity. So this is being repeated, just making it salient and attractive so that it's easy to do it and at the right time. The last thing is I want to talk about nowadays with the humanitarian crisis in the region, many aid agencies are setting up their own uh, kind of island nudge unit or looking at programs with a behavioral lens uh, to better assess the impact of their program. And I know that a lot of agencies are gonna be working with refugees, so looking at the programs with a behavioral lens could be a very important uh, a way to improve policies. At the end of my kind of uh, talk, I want to remind you of four, five things. The first thing is that context matters. 
in Arabic we say ahamiyat siyaq. It means what has worked in one place might not work necessarily in another. One more reason why we should experiment. So that is the first lesson. Um, but it's important to look at lessons learned, what has worked elsewhere and understand and start from that. But we cannot replicate experiments that were successful in one place and bring it because every country has its own and cultural sensibility that need to be factored in when you design an experiment. The second thing is that I cannot uh, overstress enough the importance of partnership. So the entire value chain of experimentation, you need to partner with academia, with NGOs, with private sector, and with government, and have their buy-in. Um, so in the teaching of this, of behavioral science nowadays, this is very common. We've tested one of the courses in behavioral science and nudge in Hamad Bin Khalifa University. We're now running a course with AV on behavioral science and nudge, which is done in collaboration between the university and and uh, and the nudge unit. And now I think uh, KPAL is going to be launching its own joint course with one of the university, either American University of Kuwait or or, or Kuwait University. So basically, it's a joint partnership to bring more behavioral science to students, to give them a real flavor of public policy experimentation before they go to the real life. The other thing that I want to stress in partnership is this thing called community of practice. And Kuwait is one of the few countries in the region that has a com vibrant community of practice. And that basically is a, a, a network, informal network of behavioral science that come from academia, from government, from NGOs, from private sector, who come together to talk about different uh, kind of challenges, shared experience, and so on. So we're going to see more of this. We're trying with, with KPAL to launch an Arab community of practice so that it becomes an online platform where we, we kind of share these lessons learned and experience and talk more uh, about this. By the way, we're having an event in Beirut on 11 and 12 of May on behavioral economics and not for the region. So we'll tell you more about this. That was a nudge. <laughs> uh, OK, so the third point is that put behavioral insights and big data. And what you end up getting is great potential. With the internet of things, with data analytics, with more internet of, of uh, attached to, to things, what we might end up having is a lot of data that you could channel to test what works. And already private sector are doing that in so many different ways, in internet, Google, and, and so on. Some of them could be used for good, some of them could be used for bad, which is my next point. So nudge is a great thing. It like is transforming the way we run government services, but we need to be careful. Nudge is a tool that could be misused. So the ethics of nudge is the next big thing. We need to think about this. We need to make sure that those who run experiments do it in the right way, are transparent about this, talk about it, publish it. And there is an ethical review of the experiment so that it's not misused. Another point that I want to cover is that now behavioral science, not only for public policy, we use it in the context of organization to improve efficiency, to improve performance, and that is done. And actually, now there's a new breed of positions called the chief behavioral officer. So nowadays, a lot of companies and organizations are creating that chief experimentation and chief behavioral scientists within their organization. And guess who would be populating this? Ideally, a lot of the behavioral sciences that we have not been thinking about, those who study psychology, those who study sociology, those who study social anthropology, these people now, you bring them to public policy and kind of this new area of experimentation and great things could happen. Um, behavioral economics is now mainstream. That's what I want to tell you. It has, it's, it's no more a single field in economics. It's actually, it's economics. Now, behavioral economics is the mainstream. 
Second thing, its applications to public policies in various settings are on the rise. And mark my words, I've been saying it, every government is gonna have its own unit soon. So we have now three or four that have been announced. You'll have more that will be announced in the, in the coming period. But even those that have not announced that are actually working on some behavioral intervention to affect uh, uh, people uh, kind of behavioral patterns. Thirdly, it is transformative. It will be bring a new skill set <coughs> in governments. So using behavioral science and public policy is going to create great things, and create more opportunities for uh, people with this skill set. It's going to bring in a new culture of experimentation. So what works is not what we think works. We should experiment and test that. And sometimes it could be easily done. So giving that culture and skill set to government officials is, a very, is going to be a very valuable tool. So capacity building through what, what KPPC is going to be doing is very <coughs> essential for various governments. So imagine, eventually, you will have small teams in every government. That's the aspiration of KPPC eventually and the, and the uh, Supreme Council, to have small units in government working on behavior experiments with <coughs> coordination from KPI. And the last thing, it will reinvent government services in an innovative way. I leave you with one thought, like Richard Thaler always uh, says, as you experiment, as you innovate, remember always to nudge only for good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Maki, for the interesting, informative, and a very engaging uh, presentation. And I think you shed light uh, on interesting facts about Nudge. At this current time, we'll take uh, questions uh, from the audience. And then we'll turn over to a final conclusion from His Excellency. We'll take a batch of three questions, and then Dr. Maki will answer. Please make your questions very concise, clear, and short. Dr. Badr al from Kisser. My question concerning the slide for organ donation, if you don't mind putting that. Uh, I just concerned that it's not that you've changed the representation whether you want to be an organ donor or not. It's just because the participant did not read. They did not know that you have to read and mark out if you don't want to be considered. So there might be some element of deception here a little bit. Uh, it strikes me as very similar to the situation in Bangladesh uh, for a campaign against public urination. They were writing, uh, do not do that in Bengali, and nobody was respecting it. But the moment they've written it in Arabic, it's the same message. Most of, most of the street people view it as a holy language, and they should stay away from it, so it succeeded. So it seems like some sort of deception going on a little bit. You know, I'm labeling deception for the lack of better word. It's not that I'm morally condemning. So would you mind explaining that? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Uh, the gentleman far right. Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Khaled Lanuzi, Minister of Health. Uh, my question uh, to the professor is uh, about, is there is any regional applications for uh, nudge units in health systems? We know that it has been introduced in the States and uh, the UK in various uh, provider organizations and even regulators. Uh, are there any regional experiments regarding that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mekki, for a very informative and excellent talk. Uh, my name is Vajan Malayan. I'm an advisor here for uh, KPPC. Um, I'm also a part-time, in my free time, I'm a behavioral researcher. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, my question is, let's say you're designing a controlled experiment using uh, behavioral insights. Within this uh, controlled experiment, you're uh, giving questionnaires uh, with behavioral insights, kind of nudging questions designed to elicit quote unquote positive response. How do we defend against those that claim that, uh, that raise eth ethical concerns basically and say that this is tantamount to psychological manipulation? Uh, thank you. Right. Um. So my, my first question to uh, the honorable gentleman. Um, yes, I mean, that, that there is, of course, the ethics of nudging. And people are raising questions about 
maybe not deception manipulation. So you can use for 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 many different reasons, and sometimes people don't treat is is a reason. That's why there is now a movement to instead of using default in some cases using active choice. So at the right time, when they're either renewing a license or doing something, they're asked a question. So a lot of now states moving to this instead of instead of the default because exactly of concerns about people not reading and not being aware. But where do we stop if, even if they don't read and people, this is good? In that case, clearly that's something that requires probably more active choice. It requires a confirmation later on by the parents and so on. But this is a very valid point. But clearly, um, there is an assumption by government that there is a, uh, 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 there is a nudging for good. And when you do that, and you couple it with transparency, with ethical review, with publication of what works, but also what did not work, when you re use kind of rigorous tools that are kind of valid, statistically, externally, internally, then you're minimizing chances of deception. But this is what worries me right now in the region, making sure as nudging rises, that more standards and more kind of safeguards are kind of linked to it. And we need to be very careful. In health, yes, there are kind of a lot of uh, experiment. I did mention the diabetes. There's a lot on adherence. There's a lot on eating healthy patterns. There's a lot on uh, kind of getting people to screen more. We're running an experiment to get people to uh, uh, more regularly do checkups because, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, the, the non-communicable disease, the earlier you discover them, the the less costly and, and the better. So there is there are quite experiments going on uh, uh, right now in in that area. Uh, positive questions and and uh, and and surveys. So. The surveys, by definition, of course, they will only tell you what people say that they will do. They probably don't measure what they end up doing. Of course, you have to do surveys. Often you start with focus groups to assess. But again, even surveys need to go through ethical review to make sure the response that you're eliciting is fair, is not kind of manipulative. Because even sometimes you ask questions, they can anchor people and then have an impact. And you can see the impact if you have the, the ability to track what they'll do. Uh, you, you could see the impact of those. But again, I stress the importance of ethical reviews, even for surveys, to make sure there's no manipulation and misuse of, of the information. Thank you. We'll take it back to another three questions. Gentlemen, front row. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fadi, for a uh, insightful talk. Saud uh, al from Advertising and Communication Sector. If I have a question about uh, the topic is the long-term effect of these nudges, and that always, uh, always comes into uh, question. With, you said the marketing have been doing it, uh, using these uh, insights for long, but marketing has the flexibility of changing campaigns every year, but with public uh, applying nudges to public pol policy, you have the challenge of uh, these nudges cost a lot to change, and uh, the policies, and it's not f as flexible as the advertising sector. So how do we go about um, being flexible and uh, like going into scale and ensuring long-term change of these nudges? Marwan Salama. Dr. Mekke, thank you very much for a very well presented uh, lecture, as well very well illustrated, which is a rarity. I shall take the devil's advocate role. Appreciate it. Nudge theory is a concept that has existed probably as old as the ancient Sumerian temples and the Pharaonic temples. More recently, it's 60 years since the famous Vance Packard's Hidden Persuaders book, which I read half a century ago. Uh, and the advertising industry and marketing has 
developed it to the nth degree to create extreme negative results of waste, overconsumption, etc. However, nudge theory is a, a, a further step or fine tuning, let's say repackaging of the concept, uh, with a more refined and, and detailed implementations. Uh, and uh, of course, it will help. However, I was surprised in your speech how marginally small the results are of the experiments done. Um, 3%, 4%, 6%. <laughs> it seems a lot of effort for very little outcome. However, another interesting point is where there was a financial reward, taxation, pe pe pension schemes, the result, the marginal improvement was higher, 10, 20, 30, 40. Which brings us to the basic original economic term of price mechanism. One has to uh, uh, keep a very clear vision of the price mechanism in <coughs> policy making. It is well and good to nudge activity, but not forget the role of price mechanism. One last fleeting comment is NGOs. I would keep nudge away. work as far away as possible from NGOs with all their very uh, dubious uh, reputation that they have developed over the past 20, 30 years in the uh, non-Western world. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan. We'll take one last question before uh, giving the answers. Uh, the lady on the far right. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm Dr. Eva Lazari from the Dasman Diabetes Institute. Hi. And I'm interested, um, lastly, to meet together. I'm mostly interested in the diabetes. This is, you know, I, it's an excellent experiment, but this is what we call in medicine is opportunistic screening. It's not really based on nudge as such. So I would like to, you know, to get your views on this because this is, you know, well, you know, developed in medicine, and this is what we call an opportunistic screening. Second question, none of the uh, experiments that were conducted probably in Qatar or Lebanon, you know, were on RCT basis. So uh, can you give uh, an <coughs> insight on this, please, as well? Thank you. <coughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, a lot of questions, great insights. So the long-term effect, um, some nudges, persist in behavioral interventions. Some don't. So that's why you need to sometimes consistently innovate. You become what I like to call an eternal lab. So always test what works. Some of them do have a lasting impact. Those who create that habitual change. Um, some of them kind of go back and regress to the mean. So we've seen that. That's why we need to constantly try. There's no panacea. Uh, uh, around this. Um, so advertising and media have been doing that. And, but they've been doing it with probably one major difference. Not necessarily nudging for public policy to kind of, not necessarily for good. I mean, they're doing it for the objective of selling consumer behavior, but also not doing it with the right rigorous kind of experimentation tools. Um, often they do, kind of, they use the nudges, they use the behavioral insights, and they do the campaigns. They do often pre-posts. So they measure, they intervene, and then measure again post. So you can never be sure in those cases what, what is the real impact, whether it's because of nudges, whether so many kind of external factors might have happened. So what, can they, what I think we'll see more is more rigorous applications and more rigorous use of methodology such as randomized control trials. So you, you mentioned, uh, sir, that there are mm, sometimes small results. Yes, sometimes it's kind of marginal, 1%, 2%. But when it's scaled up or when it's on a large scale, that's amazing result. It's, for, for us, it's resounding 
success, especially if it has been cost effective. Changing a tiny little kind of word to create that impact is so powerful, not to be left behind. So for us, it's a great opportunity to experiment. And hopefully, that could become the control itself. So that 2%, you could later on test and have that as the control and innovate with new treatments to constantly try to change. So for me, I'm, I'm not worried about sometimes small effect in some areas, not others. And again, context matters. In some geography, it has been much larger, others much less. So um, that, as I said, does not, again, take away from the fact that it is one policy tool. It's not a perfect alternative to the pricing. It's not a perfect alternative to command and control or financial incentives. In some extreme cases, and I'll give you a few examples, for instance, in Lebanon, <coughs> you can use it as a perfect alternative. So s smoking in restaurants. So literally, government has stopped enforcing. So what do we do? We're trying with social norms to get more restaurants to comply voluntarily. So that's one case where, because there's total disintegration of the, kind of the application of the enforcement in, in Lebanon of this anti-smoking ban, we're using not just as an alternative, but generally, we only talk about it as a, a complementary tool to the pricing me mechanism or the enforcement or other in, uh, incentives. So uh, for, for, um, for the medical experiments, um, yes, of course, in that case, uh, uh, it wasn't, of course, an RCT, but just to illustrate the power of, of, of small behavioral insights and how this could illustrate and can enlighten policymakers in a in very interesting way. So we've been doing a lot of um, difference in difference experiments. We've done the pre-post. We've done uh, RCTs. So the one on um, entrepreneurship was done as, as an RCT. The one on um, uh, uh, the, the, the workers' welfare was done also as RCTs. But I just want to tell you one thing. Even the, those that were done pre-post, I would say they're 10 times more rigorous than the classical tools people use or don't <coughs> use for that matter. So sometimes even small things where you observe and then get the insights from behavioral kind of uh, patterns and try to integrate it in some policies is, is very important. And we encourage that policy experimentation uh, tool. But in health, uh, I, I know that there's a lot of interest. Uh, we're discussing with uh, many universities how to integrate, not to kind of become perfect alternative, not to only create a solution through notch, but to supplement programs that they already have through behavioral insights. And maybe I should not overuse the term nudge, because nudge is one aspect of behavioral intervention that is cost effective, that is um, uh, kind of choice preserving, that's kind of one of the small types. But behavioral insights is much wider than that. And using that, integrating it in the policies is what we're trying to encourage in, in medicine, in, in education and public finance management in different ways. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take three more questions. Gentleman on the right. Dr. Hassan Jaradi, Wazarat al Awqaf, Wazarat al Islam. And it's a question for you. Have you been debating between the perspectives of the science and the perspectives of the knowledge from the perspective of an institution to change the strategy rather than the strategy? حيث يقدم على مجال الخطط التنمية في الدولة وحيث يوجه الوجهة الوطنية التي تخدم الرؤى المستقبلية من خلال إعادة صياغة التفكير والسلوك من خلال كيان مؤسس يسمى التوجيه الاستراتيجي شكرا السلام عليكم my name is Rakan Tairi I'm an intern at the UNDP I work alongside the KPC I wanted to ask Dr. Fadi um, it, it looks like that the popularity of nudge has been increasing incrementally over the years. Has there been any breakout experiments that uh, gave like a sudden boost, like, like a sudden boost in popularity, or like got the world to notice the concept of nudge? Uh, 
راح راح بجاوب بالعربي بخصوص الكيان الاطار المؤسسي بعتقد انه توجه هون بالكويت هو مأسسة هال هال هالظاهرة اللي هي النج والوكس واستعمال العلوم السلوكية ضمن إطار مؤسسي اللي هو الراعي مثلا لرؤية الكويت وإدخال الخلاصات السلوكية ضمن الاستراتيجية يعني هذا أعتقد هو التوجه وهذا أحد أهداف كثير من وحدات السلوك بال 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 بالمنطقة لإدخال المرئيات السلوكية والخلاصات السلوكية ضمن استراتيجيات التعليم ضمن استراتيجيات الصحة المالية الاقتصاد وغيره ودعمة بقرائن أكثر evidence based هذه هي الفكرة وحتى مثل probably دكتور خالد will tell you more about the, 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 the idea behind the naming لأنه very symbolic and beautiful just to make it before ideal before policies come to being and formulation they are somehow whenever possible tested as much as possible uh, uh, can, there is there are kind of depends on 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 areas getting people using social norms is now one of the most powerful types of nudges to get people to pay on time to save energy to kind of do certain things that kind of use behavioral insights here people like to hurt people like to follow a certain group, they don't like to deviate as much as possible. So a lot of things on getting people to pay on time is, is, is very famous. Uh, sometimes, um, you know those, those uh, roads signs that I showed at the beginning of my presentation? These are not just do, do done at the early 19th century when cars started to become common, basically to get people, to get cars to not have accidents as on the turning, just to tell one is going in one direction, the other one's coming in that direction. These are also nudges. There are various nudges that you hear, that you see you nudge all the time. I mean, sometimes you see next to the dustbins, green footsteps, or you see the food placed at eyesight level. These are all nudges. What has become very different is the importance of experimenting rather than going with campaigns, massive campaigns, experimenting as much as possible to try to improve those, because some of them work, but we don't know as if you've done so many behavioral interventions that we wouldn't be able to know what caused that. So there is now, we are passionate about kind of this experimentation and knowing this causality between those behavioral interventions and the impact. Okay, so we'll conclude uh, with the final remarks from His Excellency Dr. Khaled Mahdi, Secretary General. في البداية أحب أشكر أخوي بروفيسور فادي مكي على هذا العرض وهو تقريبا آخر محاضرة عندنا في سلسلة محاضرات مركز سياسات في هذا الموسم وراح نبدي مرة ثانية في شهر عشرة في نهاية المطاف أول شيء بالبداية أو شيء بداية بدأ في النهاية أول شيء أعتذر على الإزعاج اللي صار أخوي فايد القبودي ثانك يو مشكور مثل ما نقول لنا هذه المحاضرات أو هذه الجلسات هي جلسات ضوعية بمعنى أن إذا ما يكون في اهتمام لا تعني روحك موضوع ليش إحنا مهتمين وايد في موضوع دراسة الوحدات السلوكية وش علاقة بخطة التنمية هذا سؤال نسأل من الأوقاف أنا راح أجاوب على السؤال لأنه هو السؤال أنا معني فيه بالتحديد الفكرة ببساطة يوجد هناك سياسات عامة موجودة في الدولة هذه السياسات العامة لم يتم اختبارها بطريقة معينة ما ندري شنو أثارها بالتالي كان لزام علينا بأن تكون هذه السياسات لما تكون تطرح في خطة الإنمائية وتصدر بقانون ونلزم فيها جهات الدولة في التنفيذ والتطبيق أن نكون إحنا على الأقل اختبرناها بكثر ما نقدر أنا لاحظت من مجموعة من الأسئلة الوصول إلى الكمال في الشيء ما في كمال perfection هذا مستحيل القانون الثاني في الديناميكا الحرارية يقول لك هذا شيء مستحيل فانسى هذا عبارة عن complementary techniques الأشياء تكمل بعض أنا ما أقدر أسوي موضوع related حق behavior وأنسى موضوع الانسنتيفز الحقيقية اللي يتم الإنسان أو أني والله أدخل عليها شوية تواب وعقاب هي خلطة ولهذا وضع السياسات العامة ما هو سهل أخوي اللي طرح موضوع استاتيكية 
السياسات العامة مقابل ديناميكية الحملات الترويجية والتسويقية هذا أمر يعني مفهوم ومنتبهين عليه الإشكالية وين؟ الإشكالية إيش كثر أنت عندك مساحة أنك تغير أحيانا أنت تحط لك أحلى سياسة بس لا يمكن تطبقها في ظل مجتمع معين ليش؟ لأنك أنت ما عرفت تختبرها في البداية وتشوف مدى الأثر في تطبيقها وهذه كلفتنا وايد يعني في الكويت في سياسات وايدة تم تطبيقها من غير اختبارها في المرحلة الأولى ولهذا احنا سمينا المركز قبل يعني أنت قبل لا تفرض سياسة معينة و ستاند فور كابل كي اي بي ال معناته انك انت يونيد على الاقل ان يكون عندك انسايت قبل لا تي تفرض سياسه في داخل الدوله بالمجتمع وغيره ليست ليست جميع السياسات الريعيه على سبيل المثال مثل شويه بونص شويه كادر وغيره اتى بنتائج على الاقتصاد الوطني بالعكس في بعضها نتائج عكسيه كانت نتائج اوليه قد تكون إيجابية بس بالعكس صارت عادي على سبيل المثال تعديل كادر التعليم في دولة الكويت مفروض أن هذه السياسة شو تسوي في النتيجة شو تتوقع ارتفاع جودة التعليم زين طالع المؤشرات الحين شو معناته زين ما احنا ما اختبرناها بالأول احنا لو مختبرينها بالأول كان ما كلفنا الدولة مليارات مقابل شيء ما رفع لي أنا مؤشر من المؤشرات ايضا في موضوع المتعلق بالصحه ايضا المواضيع المتعلقه في العديد من السياسات اللي حطتها الدوله ما صار في عليها اختبار ولا حتى في تسليم ما ندري زين هذا النوع من اللي قاعد نسميه احنا الناج نسميه بيهيفير انسايت كون الكويت كمجتمع كوهيجن فيه جدا عالي ودائما اقول الديجري اوف سيبريشن تقريبا بوينت ناين يعني اذا انا ما اعرفك اعرف واحد يعرفك هذا الكوهيجن الموجود في المجتمع الكويتي هذا مو سهل تحط فيه سياسات ولهذا احنا نعتقد وبرأي الخبراء والمستشارين اللي اشتغلنا معهم بان في بعض المحاور نقدر نسوي عليها اكسبيرمنت بس في اشياء ما يتسوى فيها اصلا من غير ما تبدي مو مارجنال نيجاتيف يمكن يعني في بعض الامور راح نبتعد عن الامور اللي ندري ان احنا النجم راح يفيد فيها تفيد فيها اشياء ثانيه بس في امور يفيد فيها النجم يفيد فيها عدل يعني مو شويه يعني على موضوع سياسه الدعوم مثلا نعطي مثال انت بتلغي الدعوم كل الكويتيين عبالهم الغاء الدعوم عن الكل بس الحقيقه لا انت تتكلم على شرائح وعلى تارجتنج وعلى شبكه امان اجتماعي و و و هذا شلون تسوي له؟ وي نيد نج تو هيلب ولهذا هذا موجود على اساس ان نقدر نعرف ان مدى فاعليه السياسات، احنا عندنا 342 سياسه بخطه الانمائيه الثانيه ما عندي اي اختبارات عليها. هي مجرد انتوشن مجرد اعتقاد بان هذا ينفع، ان هذا له اثر. واحده تصيب الثانيه تخيب، بس على الاقل يكون عندي انا في النهايه جزء يقول لي هذا احتماليه نجاحها اكثر من هذه، احتماليه نجاحها غيره. بما ان الخطه الانمائيه تتكون من سبع ركائز في عندنا احنا بوليسي اجندا اهمها راس المال البشر هي يعني نمبر 1 هذا الهاجس الاول والاخير واللي ما يخلص منه راس المال البشري اللي هو يتعلق فيه عده امور ثلاث اشياء اساسيه وهناك امور فرعيه واحد تطابق مع سوق العمل وشكل سوق العمل واستراتيجيه سوق العمل وسياسه سوق العمل رقم اثنين وهو التعليم ومؤامته حق السوق وجودة التعليم ورقم ثلاثة شبكة الأمان الاجتماعي سوشيال سيفتي كذا ثلاث محاور رئيسية من ضمن رأس المال معظم هذه السياسات اللي راح تنطرح يجب اختبارها ولهذا وجود النج في النهاية يساعد على الأقل يعطينا شوية انسايت فهذه إجابة تقريبا يعني إن نتشل بصورة مختصرة اللي أنت طرحت استخدام الاي تي طبعا شيء طبيعي معظم الاكسبيرمنتس هذه احنا مثلا الكويت نمبر 1 يوزر في تويتر فواحده من الاكسبيرمنتيشن اللي احنا مسوينها ايش تستخدم؟ تستخدم البلاتفورم اللي كل الكويت يستخدم هذه آه. واحده آه بعض الاحيان يكون عندك انت استخدام دواوين ذاتس انذر نج هذه 
ما تصير مثلا في لبنان يمكن بلبنان يسوون هذا لما يسهرون بالمطاعم هذا يكون يسوون نجم بهالطريقه لان طبيعه المجتمع هناك مختلف عن اللي عندك فانت هني هذا الشيء يسمونه كاستمايز فانت عندك مثلا تجمع دواوين مثلا اللي نصنع القرار يتم فيه احيانا عندك موضوع مختلف تماما موضوع تويتر واستخدام الكويتيين الحين بعد الهبه انستغرام انستغرام عندك سناب شات بعض الوسائل في الاي تي ممكن استخدامها الحملات الترويجيه عموما تستخدم نج من دهر ولكن الاوبجكتيف مختلف انا ادور على منافع بنفت على الاقتصاد الوطني ويبي منافع مختلفه لما الحين انا لما احط انفستمنت انا همي بالكويت انه جوب كرييشن بعد لا تقول لي شركه تبي تسوي حملات ترويجيه عشان جوب كرييشن تبي بروفيت مارجن الكونسيبت مختلف الفاندمنتال ريزنز حقه مختلف فصراحه بروفيسور فادي مكي من يوم لقائي معاه في بيروت الى الان وشغلنا معاه في السنه اللي فاتت كلها اثبت بجداره بانه هو بالفعل عيب ان نمدحه قدام لكن هو بالفعل خبير ومتمكن في موضوع الاقتصاد السلوكي راح يكون اول اكسبيرمنتيشن لنا في شهر 9 2018 عدل 19 ولا 18 18 مع الاي يو كي امريكان يونيفرستي اوف كويت وافقوا على وجود اول كورس نتمنى جامعه الكويت تحذو بهذا لان احنا كلمناهم اذا يأسف ايضا النج يستخدم في الامور الامنيه انا جدا سعيد بوجود احد الحضور من الضباط ايضا هو يستخدم في الامور الانتليجنس سيرفيسز انك انت تعمل نج في الامور المتعلقه في الاستخباراتيه والمعلوماتيه طبعا هذا الشيء احنا ما راح نسويهم يسوونه بس نعطيهم التولز هذه بعض الامور اللي قاعد يستخدم فيها الناج مراكز الناجمتين شفتوا علم الكويت فيه وصراحه انا اشكر دكتور فادي انه هو كان احد الاسباب ان احنا قدرنا نكون المركز وحده السلوك ووضع لنا اوبريتنج مانوال حقه وباذن الواحد الاحد يكون اول اكسبيرمنتيشن معنا على شهر طبعا في اذر اكسبيرمنتيشن سويناها السؤال يطرح نفسه هل نعلن عن التجربه هذا سؤال وين الناس تسال؟ طيب في اشياء ما تعلن عنها وشلون تسوي اختبار عليها؟ بس في اشياء يراعى فيها الموضوع الاخلاقي، اخوي ماجد معنا ويسال عن الموضوع الاخلاقي، لا احنا مراعين الموضوع اخوي ماجد. شيء طبيعي يعني احنا ما راح نتكلم على نجز راح يكون فيها نوع من الان اثيكال، لا بالعكس انت لما تجي تسوي نج له علاقه بالديابيتس تقول حق الواحد ترى انت فيك سكر وانت ما تدري اعتقد هذا مو بس اثيكال هذا سوبر اثيكال. وتركيز اكثر الهيلث كير على سبيل المثال في الان سي دي سياسه الدوله الان احنا قاعد نشتغل فيها بروفيسور سانسوني از وركينج اون ات هيلث بروموشن الجماعه موجودين ايضا من وزاره الصحه ياسمين واخوي خالد دكاتره ايضا شغالين في موضوع استراتيجيه الصحه وراح نعمل نج على بعض الاشياء. باكر تبي تسوي انشورنس حق كل الكويتي كان يدو نج؟ يس ذات نيدد شلون راح نسوي هذا قصه ثانيه يعني بس هذه الاشياء احنا وي نيد تو تيست ممكن اللي ينفع في بلد ما ينفع في عندنا وهذه احد الاسباب بوجود هذا النرجس الف شكر لكم يعطيكم الف عافيه أه صراحه انا من الناس اللي استمتعت وايد بالمحاضره دكتور ومو اول مره انا اسمع لك واعتقد انك انت اعطيت فرشه جدا رائعه مع خبراتك الطويله العريضه في هذا الموضوع وان شاء الله يعني يصير في عندنا جود ار سي تيز في الكويت ونطلع منها بنتائج الف شكر